Evans and Pat Tyler will lead the group in Southern Gospel songs. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. You'll get it, you'll get it eventually. All right. Uh, sign up sheets located outside the office and in the vestibule, or you may call the office and the number's there. Deadline to sign up. Deadline to sign up is Wednesday, June the 15th. So underline the deadline to sign up because invariably I know this when I plan things for students. Guess what the number one question you get is? When's the last time I can sign up? And I'm usually asked that three days after the deadline that was posted everywhere. So deadline to sign up is June the 15th. Well, again, thank you for being with us this morning. Today is a special day. Well, every day is a special day here at Abbott's Creek Missionary Baptist Church. But today we are recognizing our graduates, and this is Graduate Sunday. And as we recognize them, they'll be coming, and I'll ask you to stand as we recognize our graduates. Please rise. Well, this year we have four graduates. One of our graduates, Luke Bowman, is unable to be with us this morning, but we do have a gift for Luke, so Bo and Sherry, be sure that we get that to you all for him. We have two high school graduates and then a college graduate, and we want to recognize them at this time. And we have a little thing, something for them. First graduate is Morgan Adams. Let's give a hand to all of our graduates. God bless each one of you on the path the Lord has for you, whatever that may be. Follow him, and everything else takes care of itself. God bless you. Good morning. Let's stand together as we sing and praise our Lord and Savior this morning.
Everybody's doing well this morning. If you would, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. And we're going to be today in chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Not a book that we're in too frequently. Um, just seems like uh, for whatever reason, uh, this is one of those books that oftentimes uh, we don't read through or go through uh, together. Uh, but today, as part of the series that we're in, uh, we're going to be in this chapter. I want to uh, just take a minute to say to the graduates, uh, excited for you guys and what's next for y'all. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing great things out of each of you uh, in the future. And as Pastor Josh said a while ago, uh, the key to all of that is keeping him at the center of everything. Uh, but we wish you guys well and are praying for y'all. In fact, let me, let me pray for them before we go any further. Father in heaven, God, thank you so much, Lord, uh, for who you are, for bringing us into this world, for bringing these young people into this world. Thank you, God, for the families that you brought them into. Thank you for the way that they have grown up. Thank you, the Lord, for their love for you. Thank you, God, for the education that they have received and for blessing them in this way. And, God, we pray now for them as they move forward. We pray that they would uh, be clear in what it is that you would have them to do with their futures. Lord, while many may not know exactly what they're going to do with a career, Lord, we know that uh, you will guide them and direct them along the way. Help them to seek your wisdom and your guidance and direction in everything. And bless them this day. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Again, First Chronicles chapter 29. And in just a moment, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Kim and I were down in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. You have to make sure you pronounce that correctly. It is Beaufort, North Carolina, and Beaufort, South Carolina, and if you say it wrong, they will let you know in a hurry. Uh, how many of you have been to Beaufort, South Carolina before? If you haven't been, beautiful place to go, just incredible beauty there, and uh, we stayed uh, down there. Kim had to work down there on Tuesday, and we decided to make a trip out of it and stay some extra time and... and uh, go out on the waterfront out there, and uh, it's beautiful on the waterfront right in the middle of downtown. Uh, we located a, a beach that now might be our favorite beach ever. Uh, it's called Hunting State Park, um, and wow, we felt like we were on Gilligan's Island, but without the SS Minnow and Gilligan in them. Uh, just palm trees and beach, uh, incredible, beautiful place. So, but one of the things we liked to do while we were there is after dinner, we would go for walks all around Beaufort, looking at old houses and just walking. And we were walking up this one street, and this gentleman came riding across the crosswalk uh, on a bicycle. And uh, he looked like um, maybe, he said he wasn't homeless, but he, he looked like he could be homeless and, uh, based on what he was wearing, just looking at the bicycle. Uh, and then him talking about some of his, his issues that he had. But uh, anyway, his, his story basically was is that he needed $56 in something to get his phone turned back on so that he could call somebody and get a job. And uh, I know that you all have probably all run into situations like that, and you're wondering what to do. Uh, what Do I believe this person? Are they really telling me the truth? And and uh, within about two minutes of the conversation, I already knew exactly what was going to happen. I was 100% positive what was going to happen. My wife bent down, grabbed her purse, and pulled out her wallet and began to look through to see how much cash she had. I knew that was going to happen. Because anytime we see anybody who looks like they might be in need, that's just what she does. In Columbia, Tennessee, there was a man named Chris who stood on a corner uh, near Walmart on a regular basis, and everybody in the town knew him, and he tried to cut yards, uh, cut grass in yards for some extra side money, 
and we'd come through that stoplight, and if the light wasn't green, that window was going down, and Kim was going to help out Chris. And so this man, we dug in, and between the two of us, we put together 50 some dollars, I think $60 ish that we had in cash and, and handed it to him. And then, of course, Kim immediately started talking to him about Jesus right after that, which the man said that he knew Jesus Christ. We had a good conversation. He drove off. We had no idea uh, for sure what he did with that money. But in reality, for all we knew, he had a great need, and my wife had the heart to do something about it. And that's the kind of heart that God wants us to have, a generous heart that wants to help others, that wants to give. Uh, And so many times in life, uh, we see people who have that kind of mindset. The question for each of us in this room and watching online today is, is our mindset that way? Do we have a giving mindset? Are, are we, would we consider ourselves a generous giver in lots of different areas of life? Not just financially, but of other things as well. Maybe today... You would say there's some areas in my life where I would consider myself to be a very generous giver. Maybe there's some areas of your life where you would say, no, you know, maybe that's not me. Uh, But think about what the Lord wants to speak to you in regard to generous giving today. Now, we're in the middle of a series. We've been going through a series over the last several weeks. Let me just review real quickly so we know uh, what we're talking about. So we, we first started out in the series, God's people in God's place doing what God called them to do. We talked about why is Abbott's Creek Missionary Baptist Church here in this community, on this curve right here, at this particular location. What is our purpose? What are we here for? What does God want us to be as a church and what, he, what does he want us to do? We then came out of that talking about our mission to love God, love people, and reach the world. That how we as a church, in everything that we do, we can do those things. That's based on the great commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it's based on the great commission, which is to go ye therefore into all the nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Based on the great commandment and the great commission, we're trying to center our ministries and center everything on are we accomplishing those things coming out of that we entered into a series on the marks of a person who's carrying out that mission what does it look like when we're being successful and we've been going through several of those different marks and today the mark that we're looking at is giving generously giving generously so with that in mind if you're able to stand as we read from 1 Chronicles 29, 1 through 9. We're reminded that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so we read from God's Word. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, And the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, Because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord. Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. 
They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. You can be seated. And the main idea I want you to take away from today's passage is this. God desires for us to give generously. For us to give generously. As we break this down, there are a couple of things that have to happen in order for us to be giving generously. And the first is this. Generous giving can only happen when you understand everything belongs to and comes from God. Let me say that again. Generous giving can only happen when you understand everything belongs to and comes from God. That's a principle that we need to learn today and remember throughout our lives. Young people who are graduating... As you begin careers, and some of you have already began working, everything that you earn, everything that you make, everything that you own in your lifetime, remember always that it, can, that it belongs to God and it comes from God. So let's look at that in this passage of Scripture. So we've got David here, and David in the context is wanting to prepare all the things that are going to be needed for his son Solomon to build the temple. Now, here in the passage of Scripture, the Bible describes the temple as the house of God. This is not exactly the same as the church, but the temple was the place where the people went to worship. Even though there were sacrifices made only by the priest and the high priest, the people gathered there in the courtyard, and that's the place that they worshipped. They uh, prayed, oftentimes looking toward the temple. And so this was the place where God met with the people and they worshipped Him, Uh, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel. So David is trying to prepare all the things to build this. God has chosen Solomon to build the temple. And David wants to make sure everything is ready to go so that Solomon can do this very thing. With that in mind, in verse 1 we're told that David speaks to the assembly. He says, my son Solomon has been chosen by God, verse 1. He's young, he's inexperienced, And the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. So David recognized that even the temple was for God, not for man. Yes, God allowed them to worship there, but it was for God. And so it's a great work to be done. Solomon is the one who's going to eventually do that. Then look at verse 2. The Bible says there, For the house of my God I've prepared... And David had prepared all these things for he gold for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver, etc. In verse 2, we're told all kinds of stones of various colors and kinds, marble slabs in abundance, all of that. And then down in verse 3, we're told, he says, Moreover, because I've set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God. So David is giving out of his own treasures he is giving to the house of God, giving to this work of the Lord. Now, before we get into the rest of these verses, and we'll come back and look at some of these verses in the next point, but in verses 2 through 9, basically, it describes everything that's been given, all right? And we'll get into the details in a minute. But everything that's been given has, is described in verses 2 through 9. Everything given to the house of the Lord has, is described in detail. But I want to fast forward for just a moment and go down to verse 10 and 11. We're going to look at some verses that I didn't read, but we will read them here. Look at verse 10. Therefore, after everything's been given, given, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And here's what he said. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is whose? Yours. It's all 
gods. Okay? Look down in verse 14, or excuse me, in verse 12. Both riches and honors come from you. Verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. Let me say that again. Of your own we have given you. Everything David gave from his own treasure, okay, was of God's. It was of God's own. God owned it. Everything that everybody else in verses 2 through 9 gave to the house of the Lord was owned by God, according to verse 14. Go down to verse 16. O Lord your God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. Everything. The pearl, the the slab floors of marble, the, the stones, the precious stones of various colors, uh, all the gold that they gave, all the silver that they gave, everything that they gave back to the house of the Lord, David affirms right here. He says, God, it's all your own. It all belongs to you. Now go back up and look how also it came from God. Not only did it belong to God, but it came from God. In verse 11 go back it says for all that is in heaven is in and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom and then in verse 12 both riches and honor come from whom from you everything that you have everything that you own Everything, young people, that you will buy, everything that you will have from your work, everything that you will have in your home one day, everything that you have, it belongs to Him and it came from Him, according to Scripture. So it's all ultimately God's. It is God's. We see the exact same thing down in verse 14. For all things come from Him. You, he says. In verse 16, for your holy name, everything for the house of God, for your holy name, is from your hand. So we see two different principles together in these verses. Everything David says that was given to the house of the Lord belonged to God. And everything that was given to the house of the Lord came from God. And that is a principle that it would do us all good to remember that everything that we have came from God and everything that we have is God's. It is His. It belongs to Him. Now, I know y'all are wondering, what are we going to do with this today? So, I had this real bad habit growing up, okay? First of all, my daddy had a tool for everything, okay? His basement was loaded with tools. If you wanted to do any project on the farm, my daddy had the tool for it, I promise you, okay? I had this really bad habit of borrowing the tools and not bringing them back. When I was a little kid, I would borrow the tools to, bring, to build a hut somewhere on the farm. My cousin Lane and I would go out and we'd make a hut where wherever we were playing on the farm and we'd build our own little shed or whatever out in the trees. You know, that's what we did back in that day for fun. And, uh, and inevitably, I would leave the tools. We are still with a metal detector looking for my grandpa's hatchet that I left on the farm somewhere. It just was a bad habit. As I got older, I got better about leaving the tools out in the woods. I didn't leave them out in the woods anymore. But when I became a married man and I was young and I didn't have all those tools at my house, I'd drive down a half mile down the road to the farm. Dad, can I borrow your tool? And, oh, sure, son, just bring it back. Months later, Daddy would go looking for his tool, needing to do some project. Where's my tool? Have you got my tool? Oh, yeah, I meant to bring that back to you. Daddy would loan the tools to my cousins across the road, and oftentimes they wouldn't come back. The reason I brought this trowel in here this morning is to show you. Do you see this blue paint on it? Daddy painted all of his tools with a strip of blue paint on it so that everybody would know when they saw the tool, 
who it belonged to. And when they'd see it, they'd go like, oh, I need to get that back to its owner. I need to get that back to Jerry. Or I need to get that back to Daddy. That's his. You see, every now and then, we just need a reminder of who owns what. And this morning, we need to be reminded that God owns it all. Everything we have is His. I don't have anything. I'm just getting to use it for a while. And you know, you could say, well, Pastor, is that, are you talking about things like tools? Well, that's everything, yes. My car belongs to God. My house, you say, well, your house, you don't, you don't own your house. No, the church owns our house. No, nope, God owns it, right? That parsonage belongs to God. This building is not ours. It's His. Everything that you have. And listen, you might say, well, is that just stuff? No. My wife belongs to God. My kids belong to God. My parents belong to God. Everybody in here is His. And everybody that is in your life, God has given them to you for this time in your life. So, it's people in our lives. It's things in our lives. It's everything in our life. It all belongs to God, and it all comes from God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, and also the earth with all that is in it. Does that pretty much sum it up? <laughs> Everything in the heavens, everything on the earth, the earth itself, and everything in it belongs to God. Over in the book of Haggai, chapter 2 and verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18, listen to what it says. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as in this day. All your wealth came from God. You say, well, I worked hard for it. He gave you the ability to work for it. There's nothing that we have. That is not attributed to Him, given by Him, and owned by Him. God did all of it. James chapter 1 verse 17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift. Everything that we have is His and comes from Him. Could you imagine if we would remember that daily? in our lives, how it would affect how we feel about our things. Everything that we have. If we would just realize that. Now, you know what that says to me? That says to me that if it's His, then it matters how I use it. Doesn't it? It matters how I use it. It matters what I do with it. Now, that can relate to people if my wife is His, it matters what I do with her and to her. If my kids are His, it matters what I do to them and, and with them. It matters. And you can say that about any relationship that you have. It matters how I treat them because they belong to God and they came from God. And they're a gift from God. It matters what I do with my body. Scripture says... That this body is not my own, it is His body. And that I am to present this body as a living sacrifice to Him, holy and acceptable. That's what this body is to be done with. If this is God's body, then doesn't it matter what I do with this body? And those little babies that are being aborted around the world, those are God's babies. And it matters what we do with them. I didn't intend to say that, but it just fit this morning. We need to understand that every body is a gift from God, made in the image of God. 
and they matter. And everything that I have should be used for His glory. The Bible says, do everything that I do for the glory of the Lord. As if I'm doing it for the Lord. Everything. So young people, many of you again, you're already working. I told my son, I told my daughter, I had a talk with them the day they started their job. Ben's first job was at a car wash, Autobell Car Wash in Concord, North Carolina. I said, Ben, you're going to be washing, they're going to, cars are going to come out and they're going to be washed and you're going to detail them. You be the best detailer of cars ever in history. You be the very best vacuumer of cars ever in history. You do it as if you're doing it to the Lord. You're going to set the tone for your job and your work uh, mindset and your work ethic. You're going to set the tone for all of that. In this very first job, you're going to set the tone for that. Do it as if you're doing it for God. Be the best that you can be. I said, you may not be the best, but you strive to be the best because you're doing it for the Lord. It's His. So that job you get, it's from Him. You say, I don't like my job. It's still a gift from Him. Maybe you should be thankful that He gave you a job. Maybe you should just say, you know what? God gave me this job. I don't particularly care for what I'm doing, but it's provided for me, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it while I do it for the, for the glory of the Lord. Everything that I do is for Him. It belongs to Him. It's from Him, and I'm going to use it for Him. Go back over to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 again. And there's a second truth that must happen in order for us to be a generous giver. And that is this. Generous giving can only happen when God has your whole heart. Now, I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm not talking about the moment you were saved. When you called on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, He got your heart. He created in you a different heart. You're a new creature in Christ. Uh, your inner man was changed forever. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about when you give, you give with your whole heart. That your heart's into it. That's what I'm talking about. So generous giving can only happen when God has your whole heart. That's what we're speaking of. So go back here and look at verse 2 again. And David said, Now for the house of my God I have prepared with what? With all my might. I've put all my energy into it. I've put all my might into this. Look in verse 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God. David set his affection on it. His, he had a love in his heart for the house of God. A love in his heart for the temple that... that his son was going to build a love in his heart for the fact that worship would take place there and that the people would be able to come there and worship God. He had a love in his heart for that. Do we have a love in our heart for the place that we come to worship God every week? A love for it. I'm not talking about just a love for the building, a love for God and the people here that are gathered. The church is the people. This house of God is not just a building the people are the house of God as well. Do we have a love and an affection for that? That's what David had. It says in verse 3, He gave out of His own special treasure. Out of His special treasure. You know, sometimes we're willing to give and help somebody willing to give something that we have, part with something we have, and then there's some things we're like, well, I'm willing to part with this, but do I have to get rid of this one over here? That's like my favorite. David gave out of his own special treasure. Out of his own special treasure. Now I can tell you, I remember doing this before, I'll confess. I've offered to help somebody before who needed help with cash, some stranger on the street. And I pulled, in, I remember pulling my wallet out before and looking in the wallet and I had a 10 and I had a 5 and I had a 20 and I had a 100 
And I looked at that hundred and I said, no, nah, not that one. Gave the 20. Oh! <laughs> okay, God, I'm going to help this guy. <laughs> but, but I don't want to give him the hundred here. I mean, you're not out of my special treasure over here. You know, I mean, how many times do we do that kind of thing? Where we're not willing to give out of our own treasure. That's what David gave out of his special treasure. It says in verse 4, 3,000 talents of gold. 7,000 talents of refined silver. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? 3,000 talents of gold is 110 tons of gold. 7,000 talents of refined silver is 260 tons of silver. David gave out of his own special treasure. He didn't just go over and get a few silver items and say, Here, Lord. Verse 5 says, Who then is willing? This is a key word throughout this passage. You might want to underline or circle it. Who then is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord, to set himself apart to the Lord today? And then what happened in verse 6? After David led the way, what happened? The leaders of the fathers' houses, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands, hundreds, the officers. So all the leadership under David joined in and they all offered how? Willingly. Willingly. Verse 7, they gave for the work of the house of God. And they gave all of these different things in verse 7. Verse 8, and whoever had precious stones did what? They gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord. Verse 9, the people rejoiced for they had offered how? Willingly. Because with a loyal heart, they had offered how? Do you get the idea that they all offered willingly? That that's what they did? Anytime you see a word repeated multiple times, it brings to the point that there's importance to this word in the passage. Willingly, 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 willingly. It's, it's a heart for it. It's not that I'm reluctant, but that I'm completely, willingly doing this. Verse 14, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so what? Willingly as this. Down in verse 17, I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have what? Willingly offered all these things. And now, with joy, I have seen your people who are present here to offer what? Willingly to you. This is not just once or twice. This is like... Time after time after time in the passage that they offered it willingly. And then he says in verse 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. And then give my son Solomon a loyal heart. Verse 20. Now bless the Lord your God, so all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers. They bowed their heads and prostrate, prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. They worshiped him. But what I want you to see from all of those verses, they did it from the heart. They did it willingly, with a loyal heart. Sometimes that's hard. It's hard. One of the things that Kim likes about her job when she travels, and she doesn't love everything about the travel, but one of the things she likes is she gets rental cars all the time. And every now and then she'll get to the rental car place and they'll give her an upgrade to something that's really cool. Sometimes, for example, they give her a Dodge Charger. She... She has a choice when she flies down to do her work in Beaufort, South Carolina. She has a choice. <clears throat> she can go to Savannah, which is closer to Beaufort, fly into Savannah and drive up to Beaufort from Savannah, which is not that bad of a drive. Or she can fly into Charleston and drive a whole lot further to get to Beaufort. 
She always goes to Charleston instead of Savannah. The reason that she goes to Charleston instead of Savannah is because every time just about that she goes to Charleston, they upgrade her to a charger. My wife likes muscle cars. She gets it from her daddy sitting over here. She likes muscle cars. I had a 65, I have a 65 Mustang I've had since I was 13 years old. Her, one of her first cars, if not the first car, was a, a Cougar Eliminator. Some of you will know what that is. Okay? The only reason she didn't get to drive it long is because her mama said it was too powerful, right? Isn't that kind of how it went? But she loves muscle cars, you know? So her dream car one day is, is a Dodge Charger. That's what she wants, okay? She right now is driving a Chevy Cruze with a four-cylinder. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Every time she gets a Charger, she goes and she says, you know, I got to go take this car back. And she goes into the car rental place with the keys. And she's looking back over at the charger as she's going. You know? Oh. And, and she reluctantly hands the keys back to them. Because it's theirs. But it's like, so hard. She comes home telling me about it. It was so hard to turn that charger back in. I just wanted to keep that charger and drive it. I didn't want to give it back. Reluctantly giving it to them. Sometimes we give, we do the right thing, but we do it reluctantly. Sometimes we give and, and we don't give it with our whole heart. Our heart's just not in it when we give it. But God wants the heart in it. In fact, He's more interested in the heart being in it than what we actually give. So are we giving it with a true heart for God? That's the question. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, listen to what it says. So let each one Give as he purposes, where? In his heart. Not grudgingly. Not of necessity. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. So when we give to somebody, it's not like give it and then like... It's to give it with joy whatever it is that we're giving back to God. In Luke chapter 6, verse 30, who are we to give to? Give to everyone who what? Everyone who asks of you. You see, that's, that's why, even when you don't know what they're going to do with it, I'm not saying if you, if you know there's a history of something, you know about somebody who's a scam artist or something, and you know that, but I'm talking about when you don't know, even when you think, when you look at them, you're like, I know they're going to go do this with that. To anyone who asks, you give it. And from him who takes away your goods, don't ask them back. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. What do we do within the body of Christ? Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Anybody that had a need in the body of Christ in that day, one of the reasons, and Pastor Josh and I were talking about this this week, one of the reasons that this was going on was because they were being persecuted and oftentimes they could not go in and buy and sell goods in the marketplace because in order to buy and sell goods in the marketplace, they had to do something to the gods of the Romans in order to buy or sell. And they refused as Christians to worship some false god in order to buy and sell. So they divided up among themselves and took care of each other. May I just tell you, that day may happen real soon right here in our country. Where we have to take care of each other because we won't be able to buy and sell 
without worshiping some other God and giving in to something that we don't believe in. But the bottom line is, anybody who asks, we're supposed to help, but we're especially supposed to take care of each other. And this is not on the IMAG up here, but Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we're to do good to everybody. So let me just say this. Part of what I'm talking about this morning is financial. Giving to the work of the Lord from my heart. A cheerful giver. Giving with a loyal heart. Uh, giving not reluctantly, but with joy uh, for the work of the Lord. It's part of, partly financial. But it's also giving of our time. It's giving of our talents. It's giving to help other people, like giving somebody a coat or, or giving them groceries or, or giving them a ride somewhere or just helping people in general. So when I'm talking about generous giving, I, yes, I'm talking financially, but I'm also talking about giving of our time, our talents, our efforts, and giving whatever anybody needs. When we see somebody in need, do we have a heart that wants to help them? Do we have that kind of heart? That's what God wants us to have. And the only way we can have that, the only way I can have a generous heart is first for God to change my heart. And that happens through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? As we come to our time of invitation this morning, Maybe there's somebody right now that you would say, well, Pastor, I don't know that my heart's ever been changed. I don't know that there's ever been a time that I've asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, but I want to do that. If you're in the room, here's what I want you to do. We're going to stand and sing a song in just a second. Pastor Josh and I will be down here at the front. You just come down and say, I want to pray to receive Christ. And we'll walk you through that. Or if you just want to ask more questions about it, just come let us know that and we'll set up a time to talk with you further about that and help you answer your questions. If you're watching online, you can pray right where you are and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And after you've done that, reach out to us here and let us know so that we can follow up with you and tell you what's next in that process that God wants you to do after you've trusted Christ. Maybe today God's calling you to join our church. If you're watching online, let us know that. If you're here in the building, you can come down front and just say, I want to join the church, and we'll walk you through what that process is. But all across the room, and many watching online today and the days ahead, what kind of giver are you? Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart right now. Am I a generous giver? Because really... If we're going to love God and love people and reach the world, we have to be generous in our giving of our time, of our treasures, of our talents. Am I a generous giver? And more than anything else, I hope we'll walk away from today with plant this deep into your heart. Let the Holy Spirit plant it deep into your heart. Everything that you have Everything is His. And it came from Him. And therefore use it for His glory. Father, I pray that You would move in the hearts of everyone in this room and lead us to decisions that would bring glory to Your name. Change us, O oh God, where we need to be changed. Change our hearts, our attitudes, our mindsets toward being a giving person who gives generously. And thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing as we sing, you come as God is speaking to you.
you pray with me? Father in heaven, God, thank you so much for who you are and that you are a giving God who gives generously to us. We acknowledge in this place this morning that you own it all and that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you more than anything else this morning that you gave your own son Jesus to die for our sins on the cross. We know that you didn't have to do that, but you loved us enough to do that anyway. Help us, therefore, to have a giving heart. Change our hearts, O oh God, I pray, that we might live our lives according to your will and that our heart might be loyal to you, to your house, to your work. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to be a people who seeks to reach the world for Jesus and use our giving as a part of that, I pray. We'll give you glory for what you do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.